he is a part of the multi-talented soft rock legendary group Air Supply, Mr. Graham Russell. Mr. Russell, how are we doing today? I'm doing good, JJ. How are you? Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much for uh, being a part of the 80s experience tonight. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. You got it. Now, Graham, take us back to the beginning when uh, you were growing up in Sherwood, uh, Nottingham, England. And who were you inspired by musically growing up? Well, there there was only one group that really turned me on, and that was the Beatles, of course. You know, I used to dash home from school and listen to Pop Go the Beatles. It was on the BBC radio, and I remember it was on a Tuesday night at 5 o'clock, so I had to really rush, and the Beatles played live at the BBC for half an hour, and it was it was like something I'd never heard before, and I was just all over them, you know, and even to this day, I still get inspired by all their music, you know. Yeah, the Beatles were one of a kind. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. How did you begin your, your solo career at the beginning? Well, you know, I started writing songs when I was 11 years old, and I and I used to write poetry and stuff like that. I, mean, I think a lot of the kids do when they're that old. But I just really enjoyed it, and I started to play guitar and piano. I learned piano very young. And so I just used to make my own songs up and used to play them around for people. And then I started to work in uh, coffee bars and uh, pizza parlors and folk clubs, you know. But I was playing my own songs, so it was kind of difficult because nobody really did that in those days. But I just persevered, and I knew that was what I wanted to do when I left school, you know. It was, it, it's always been the, a passion of mine. And then how did you meet up with uh, Mr. Russell Hitchcock? It happened in Sydney, Australia at one point? It was 1975, yeah. We were both in the production of Jesus Christ Superstar in uh, Australia, and we were probably the only two people that hadn't been in a production before. Everybody else were kind of seasoned theatrical performers, and Russell and I didn't know each other, and so we gravitated towards each other because uh, we were the the two odd men out, you know. And uh, then we started to sing together, and we realized that everybody kept saying, wow, you guys sang great together. And uh, so we made a record, and we put the record out as Air Supply, and uh, it went straight to number one in Australia. And so we were kind of on our way, you know. And we made the album in a week, and that came out, and that went to number one, too. So then we were kind of off and running uh, while we were still in the show. Some of these bands, it takes them, you know, five to six years to get a break, and then, you know, you guys go go into the studio, and you guys have that magic right off the top, and uh, that's just wonderful. Well, we we did. We knew there was something going on, but we worked hard for it. During the show, we realized that we had the run of the show before we would be out of a job, and, and we said we wanted to keep working together, and we wanted to keep working, you know, and so we hustled to get jobs after Superstar would finish at 10 o'clock. We'd go out and do folk clubs and play in these bars and stuff with just the two of us with a, an acoustic guitar and two vocals, but we got a really strong reputation, you know, and people kept coming to see us. But we were fueled on by this fact that we were in Superstar. That really gave us a leg up. But we, I still think at that time we had the goods. And we sounded good, you know. And they were original songs. And so we had everything going for us, you know. Then I know you guys went on tour with Rod Stewart. And you guys hit America. Didn't really break through in America. But then you came back to Australia. And you guys recorded uh, the first American AC number one hit, uh, Lost in Love. Which landed in the hands of uh, music executive Clive Davis. How did that all come about? Well, we... Yeah, we talked with Rod and we thought oh we're going to break open for sure but you know we didn't and it was good that we didn't because Mm -hmm. it really brought us down to earth and it made us dig a little deeper because once we'd seen America we wanted to go back there because that's where it was all happening and uh, we got back to Australia they'd forgotten all about us and I went away and wrote some songs I took like three months off. I don't, not off, because I wasn't working anyway, but, uh, you know, Air Supply was still doing shows, but we were broke. And I just went away for some time and decided to write some songs. And in those songs, we were a lot of love, chances, and lost in love. And we made another album for Australia, but nobody would touch it in America. Then suddenly, we got a call from Clive Davis saying that he bought the single. And I know, I'll never forget, he called me up, and I don't know how he got my phone number, and he said, you know, we're releasing Lost in Love, and it's going to go all the way. You better prepare for that, because it's going to happen. And he was dead right. He was he was the, the main force behind our success from Lost in Love on. You know, he was hands-on, and, uh, you know, we he was involved in every aspect of our career at that point. He really believed in us, and he said, you know, you guys are, you can have a great career, but you've got to, you've got to listen to him, and you've got to take what I say as, uh, as guidance, and we did, you know. And we, we didn't even know who he was at that point, but then when we figured out he was responsible for pretty much half of America's uh, musical culture, then, you know, we said, oh, wow, this is great. We were in great hands. Yeah, he but, was the best. He was the best, you know. Yeah, when you have Clive Davis on your team, that's always a good thing. 
<laughs> it is, you know. I mean, he, and we sometimes we would say, well, the stuff he was saying, we we didn't believe, you know. I remember when we were in the studio and we were on the next album, he was listening to the one that you love, and he came in and he said, wow. He said, it's gonna, this song will win you a Grammy and it's going to number one. And at that point, whatever he said, we believed him and he was right, you know. And so we, we love that. It was great to have him on our side, you know. And I know you guys uh, released Lost in Love here in America, and it just it just took America by storm. And then the follow-up hit single, um, All Out of Love, how was that song invented? And I think Clive Davis, you guys originally released it over there in Australia, and then Clive Davis wanted you guys to change a couple of lyrics in the tune? He did, yeah. It was released in Australia in 78, and it was a number one record there. But in the chorus, it had, I'm all out of love, I want to arrest you, which, you know, to... A lot of people means to get your attention, but Clive quite rightly said, if you say I, rest, I, I want to arrest you, it sounds like you're, gonna, you're convicted of something. So he said, you, you need to change it. And he said, what about I'm so lost without you? And, he, and I said, yeah, it sounds great. So uh, that was the change. And whether or not it would have been a hit without that change, I don't know. But now, of course, it's musical history. And, uh, and that was Clive's line. And I think it's a great line. So we said, yeah, let's go with it. And, and that went all the way, too. The very last single from the album, Lost in Love, I loved the album Lost in Love when I was growing up. It was a tune yeah. called um, Every Woman in the World to Me. What's the interesting story behind that great song? I know you mainly wrote most of the lyrics for the band, uh, Graham. Is there any interesting story behind that tune? Well... Not really, you know, I, I, we never thought that was a single potential, to be quite honest, because it's a very kind of poppy song. And Clive said, he said, it could never be a first or a second single, but he said, it's a perfect third single, because it's a little different, it's a little poppy, it's not so heavy as All Out of Love, which is kind of very majestic. And he said, he said if you release that, then it's, you're going to have another top five single, and you'll have three off one album. And we weren't that sh so sure about that, but, you know, once again, Clive said, Said, let me go with it. He said, I mean, he was going to anyway. <laughs> he wanted our blessing. He said, Yeah, okay, you're in charge. And he put it out. And sure enough, like two weeks later, it was at number five. So we were thrilled, you know. That's very interesting from Clive Davis' point of view. We're lost in love, all out of love, and then every woman in the world to me. That's, that's very interesting how he kind of came up with those in that order. That That's interesting. Yeah. It's funny because in those days, in the very early 80s, things like that were so important. And it was that kind of stuff that we learned very quickly, that you can't just, it's no good just making a record. You've got to have hit songs on a record. Then you're going to sell the album, you know, and if you sell the album, people are going to come to your shows. So it's this uh, monster that devours itself, and it keeps going, you know. It's like a atomic fission. It just feeds off itself, and he was so right. And, and, and it's just, and it's such a wonderful uh, machine that you and uh, Russell put together. Just a great, great, it's just the, the sound like, even if you didn't know the song that you're listening to on the radio was Air Supply, you would know yeah. it would be just from your amazing sound you guys put together. Yeah, well, that's very kind of you. I think, you know, in our early career, we did have a certain sound, but it, well, we didn't try and create it by design. We didn't sit down and say, okay, what are we going to sound like? We just sang, and it's what we already sounded like, you know, with Russell's incredible voice, and he still sings like that today, you know, and, you know, we, we have the ingredients, we had them then with Russell's voice and great songs, beautiful melodies, and uh, and great music, and that's what we try to create all the time, you know. The, the title track to your amazing album, uh, the one that you love became air supplies very first hot 100 american number one hit and how did that yeah. song originate uh well i wrote that what we used to do in those days we'd tour for nine months in the u.s and japan and asia and then we'd go home for three months and make another record and we, and we were always recorded in sydney so we'd go home for three months and then i'd start writing and that was the first song i wrote for the next album and i i remember just doing a rough of it and and playing it for Russell uh, to see if he liked it, you know, and he, he was all over. He said, oh, wow, this is a great song. And I, I felt it was. I, I thought I thought it was would be the perfect follow-up to the Lost in Love album. And then, of course, when Clive heard it, he flipped out and said, oh, my God, it's great. The sophomore single release on that album was the tune uh, Here I Am, which is one of my personal favorites. How did you and Russell come up with that tune? That song was written by uh, 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 Norman Salit, who's a songwriter from Los Angeles. Okay. Who's a, a super a super guy and it was a song that he'd sent in to Clive and Clive listened to it and he said you know this would be great would you be interested in doing it and uh, you know I listened to it and I, I realized it was a really excellent song and Russell loved it 
and we knew that Russell would be singing it, so the decision was really Russell's, and he said, yeah, let's do it. Because if you've got a great, another great song on an album, then you're only adding ammunition to your arsenal, you know, and, and Clyde picked it for the second single, which was a wise choice, and, you know, it's a, a great favorite of ours, even today when we, when we play, you know. And then I know you guys released the tune uh, "Sweet Dreams," and I know uh, Graham, you really didn't think it, it was it, it could have been a single release, but it, it was so so different than all the other songs you've you've recorded, even as the album tracks on the other albums. It stood out so yeah. much, and it just has that real dreamy, uh, nostalgic feeling to it. How did you come up with that tune? Uh, you know, I I just bought this. Roland keyboard. It was a, a JP4 in those days. Of course, it's, now it sounds like it belongs in a museum. <laughs> but it had this really cool piano sound, which I loved. And I just kind of wrote the song in about half an hour. I remember I was at my, I was visiting my father in uh, Queensland, Australia, and uh, I carted this keyboard up there. And he went out to play bingo, and, and he said to me, "Oh, do you want to come?" So I, I said, "No, I want to play my keyboard." And when he came back about, I don't know, two hours later. Uh, I sat him down and said, oh, I just wrote a song, I want you to listen to it. And I played him Sweet Dreams, and he said, oh, well, that sounded nice, you know. <laughs> and then uh, when Clive heard it, he said, oh, this is another single. But I never thought it was, because it was different for us. Right. It was very, very heavily orchestrated, and it was really like a band song, and not, uh, you know. But then when you, if you think about it, it had all the ingredients that we had in those days. You know, we had me singing a little bit, Russell, of course, singing the lead vocal, and uh, a beautiful melody. But uh, the cloud was right again, you know, it was, I think it went to number three or something. I know uh, Air Supply's last American Top 100 Top 10 hit was written by songwriter Jim Steinman. It was called uh, Making Love Out of Nothing at All, originally written for Meatloaf, and then Meatloaf didn't want it, and then it was given to you guys. Is that how that story goes? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we kind of knew Jim, you know, and I knew he... Uh, he sent this song to Clive, and from what I understand, uh, you know, Clive just loved it straight away. And we had a Greatest Hits album coming out, and Clive said, well, I really would like to put this song on there. And I, I, I resisted a little at first, because I wanted the, the Greatest Hits to be all, all our big hits, and we've had quite a few then. And, but he said, by the, Clive said, by the time the album comes out, this song will be a big hit for you, so don't worry. And he was right again, you know, it, and it went to number two. And uh, funnily enough, the song that was number one that stopped us being number one again was another Jim, Jim song, uh, Bonnie Tyler, uh, Total Eclipse of the Heart, which I love. Yes. So, but it, you know, it's funny because it, Jim was such a different songwriter than myself. He's, he's so intense and epic that I learned a great deal from that and from the session and when we, we hung out a little bit and it, it was great, you know, and it, being there and naturally the, uh, the E Street band played on that track in New York. Oh, really? They did, yeah. It was uh, Roy Bittan on piano, uh, Max Weinberg on drums and Rick Derringer on guitar, who's a monster guitar player. Wow, I did not yeah. know that. Wow, very uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, it was. It was great. And I hadn't met those guys until we got there and, but it was great. They were super guys and uh, you know we spent all day and got the track in a day and Russell sang it first take that same day but uh, what a great song you know I mean I love and I'm a songwriter but I love great songs not necessarily just my own but uh, I'm a big fan of anyone that writes a great song and you know Jim Steinman is one of the best songwriters of our generation I've always thought that. Graham tell me what you and Russell are uh, working on these days and tell me more about the Mumbo Jumbo project. All right yeah well Mumbo Jumbo came out last not this May, the May last year, and uh, it was a concept album, and everybody said, oh, you, nobody does concept albums now, and I thought, perfect, that's why we're going to do it. So <laughs> we did it, and we didn't expect that much, but we had two top 30 songs off it, and we were thrilled with that. Uh, but it was a, an album we wanted to do, and uh, yeah, now it, the songs from that album are just as popular as, as, as any of our other big hits, you know. It's great. Very nice, and I know you guys were just in tour in Japan and Canada, and you're coming back through the United States. I know on October 15th, you're going to be playing the Grove in Anaheim, California, which is about 20 minutes away from us, so that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. We, we do Vegas this weekend, then we go to Israel, London, Dublin, and then we, then we get to relax. We fly a, on a G4 to Aruba, so we can chill out a bit on that on that trip. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, so, Graham, tell me what that experience is like. I mean, traveling the world and seeing the world, and uh, I mean, what, what is that experience like for you personally? Well, it, it's incredible. It's like a, a, a 
it's always been a childhood dream of mine. You know, when I when I first used to go and see bands when I was very young, when I was 14 and 15, I used to go and see them in, in Nottingham, where I'm from, and I used to see them rocking out up there. I say, oh wow, what I'd give to do, to do that and to drive all over England and and play every night a different place that would be my dream. But uh, and of course that's come true. But now it's not just England where we fly all over the world now, and we're kind of used to it. But I love it, and you know, I'm we really treasure what we do, and I'm very proud of of this band and my contribution to it and I'm very uh, thankful for the career I've had and I don't I never take advantage of it I work really hard to keep doing what we're doing and we're good at what we do but and we have a great life you know and we protect it and we're very thankful for it you know thank you so much for taking your time JJ it's a pleasure it's been a wonderful interview and thank you for the opportunity